Good af afternoon and well, 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 and welcome to the American Floral Endowments Grow Pro Web Webinar Series. I am your mod your moderator for the day, Mary Lewis with Syngenta Flowers North America. Today's session is on developing an integrated pest control program for whitefly on poinsettia. On behalf of the endowment, I'm excited to be a part of AFE's Grow Pro webinar series that, fe that features a new topic every month presented by an industry expert. These webinars are free to everyone thanks to the generous support of AFE sponsors. This ses ses session is sponsored by BASF and BioWorks. BASF is a multinational chemical com company that creates chemistry for a sustainable fu future, combining economic success with environmental protection and social responsibility. BioWorks helps customers in the, hort the horticulture and specialty agriculture market successfully deliver crops to mark market with biologically based solutions and support. If you'd like to learn more about our sponsors, or if you are a supplier and interested in becoming a sponsor for a top topic, you can find that information on AFE's website at endowment.org slash growpro. That link will be in the chat. So today's session was pre-recorded in English by Dr. Sarah Jandrisic. After the presentation, Dr. Jan Jandrisic will join us for a Q&A. Feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A fe feature or chat at any time. We will answer as many as we can before the end of the hour. Unanswered questions may be answered through a separate email exchange. This session is being record recorded and will be shared to AFE's YouTube account. Through YouTube's accessibility fe features, you can access closed captions in other languages. To get us started, I'd like to share a bit about today's expert speaker, Dr. Sarah Jandrisic. Dr. Jandrisic is the, green, is the Greenhouse Floriculture Integrated Pest Management Specialist for the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Culture, Food, and Rural Affairs, where she works directly with growers to help manage pest issues and find research solutions. She has worked continuously in Floriculture IPM for over 20 years. As a part of her current position, Sarah runs the One Floor Culture blog to keep growers informed about recent pest control advances and issues facing the industry. Sarah, welcome and thank, thank, thank you for presenting today on developing an integrated pest control program for Whitefly on Poinsettia. Well, thank you, Mary, for that introduction, and I think we'll just get right into it. Um, so we're going to talk, be talking today about developing an integrated program for whitefly in poinsettia. So for those of you unfamiliar with uh, Ontario as part of the floriculture industry, we're actually the third largest producer of floriculture crops in North America, which not many, very many people know, behind California and Florida and ahead of Michigan. And most of this production takes place in a very concentrated region. So in the Niagara region here of Ontario, which is just um, on the other side of the border of Buffalo. So it's a really important horticulture crop for us. So today we're gonna to be talking about white fly species and we get three main species in floriculture crops in Ontario, banded wing white fly, which is a sort of an occasional pest. So the two big ones are greenhouse white fly and Bemisia. So greenhouse white fly can affect poinsettias, um, but it's really easy to control with both biocontrol and pesticides. Occasionally it comes in through vents from nearby vegetable crops grown outside, but um, that doesn't happen too often anymore. So what we're really gonna be focusing on today is Bemisia tabaci. So some of you may be aware that Bemisia is actually now discovered to be a complex of a bunch of different species. I think somewhere between seven to 14, and maybe they're gonna discover more. But the two we need to focus on today are um, meme one, which used to be known as the B biotype when we thought they were just biotypes and not species, and med, which is Q. So I'm just gonna call them B and Q for the, the sake of ease, and it's what I'm more familiar with. So these are our main pests in poinsettia. We know they come in on the cuttings. Um, 
They don't overwinter outdoors in Canada, so they don't usually come in from the outside onto our poinsettia crops. And both B and Q, and we'll talk about this a little later in the talk, have the capacity to develop resistance to pesticides and a lot of different pesticides. So that's one reason why we're focusing on them because they're more difficult to control in an IPM program. So the backbone of the Canadian IPM program is really biocontrol, and it's one of our Canadian success stories. So I'm going to be focusing on this first. And um, one of the things we had to do when we were developing this program is convince growers why biocontrol works. And growers usually have uh, a bunch of concerns around biocontrol that make them a little hesitant to dive into it. And the same concerns happened with our growers as well. And I'm sure all of these will sound familiar to you that ornamental crops basically have zero thresholds for pests. So how could biocontrol control things perfectly? Biocontrol is just too complicated. It has a lot of moving parts compared to spraying a pesticide. Biocontrol is just not as effective as pesticides. And even if it were, biocontrol is just too expensive. So we're gonna go through each one of these and sort of um, hopefully bust the myths enough to con convince you. So the first one is whether or not um, crops really do have a zero threshold for pests. I think we like to say this a lot in the ornamental industry, especially to growers of other crops, because we just want to prove just how hard our, our crop is to grow. And that is generally true. But over the years, we found um, that it's not really accurate that we're sending plants out there to consumers and retailers um, pest free. We all know that we're not perfectly controlling our thrips, nor are we perfectly controlling our whitefly. So my predecessor, Graham Murphy, um, who worked uh, at OMAFRA for 30 years, um, he actually developed a whitefly threshold, um, one that proved to be sellable um, so growers could have a benchmark so that they would know if their program was working. So basically what he figured out over talking to growers and seeing how much crop their crop was successful in selling and any um, credits over his 30 year career, was that if 20% of the crop was infested with whitefly by mid-October, it's sellable. Obviously under that would be sellable as well, but if it's over than that, that's when you start risking credits and things like that. So again, this was based on years of research and it's not just the Canadian growers who ship within Canada. A lot of us export, we're, we export a lot of our ornamentals. So these are um, in response to US customers as well. And just to note that this is all done with presence absence sampling. So when I say 20% infested, I don't really care about the number of white fly on the plant. It's just yes, no. Does it have one white fly or 100 white fly or is it completely clean? Um, and that's a lot easier than counting the actual number of white fly on the plant. Um, and we'll get more into that later when we talk about how to sample or how to scout the plants. So if you are interested in numbers, um, this work was done by my colleague, um, Dr. Erfan Buffet, uh, who uh, works at Texas A&M, but is actually a Canadian. Um, he looked at over 350 plants at Texas retailers. So we're talking big box stores, grocery stores, and florists. And you can see here um, that the average number of immatures ranged from anywhere to, from four per plant, that would be great and low, up to 73 per plant. The adults were a little bit lower, but no matter what the pressure, all of the plants were still considered good quality. So on a rating scale of one to 10, one being you know sooty mold and white fly everywhere to 10 being pretty clean on a quick inspection, most of these plants were an eight to 10. So ultimately what he found is the, that indeed the threshold for white fly at the retailer is not zero. Around 35 to 100% of all the plants found at these retailers were infested with some white fly and around four to 40 white fly nymphs per six inch plant sort of is what seems to be acceptable. So having sort of busted that first myth, we're on to uh, whether or not biocontrol is too complicated. And I would totally agree with this assessment if you've never done biocontrol before and you're looking at a crop that has a big pest complex. So think about something like cut Gerbera. They get thrips, they get aphids, they get whitefly, they get spider mite, they can get mealybug, they can, you know, on and on and on. And you have to think about all the different natural enemies to manage that. And then you have to think about each one of your pesticides and how that's gonna affect the biocontrol program for each one of those pests. So that's a very complicated program where it's more like an ecosystem. 
But poinsettia is actually where the sort of like the gateway drug into biocontrol in Canada. And that's because it's a pretty simple pest complex. You really just have white fly and occasionally you might have Lewis mite or fungus gnats, which are pretty both pretty easy to control. So white fly is really your, your number one pest. So when it comes to the biocontrol agents for white fly, there's really only four main ones. So there's two predators. Delphastis, which is a beetle that eats all stages of white fly, but mostly we consider it an egg predator. There's predatory mites. So Swirsky or Lamonicus is what you want to be looking at here. Um, Cucumerus doesn't do a good job at white fly. So Swirsky or Lamonicus eat eggs and um, nymphs. Um, they're usually the first instar nymphs. And then we've got our two parasitic wasps. So Eremoceros and Encarsia, both parasitize nymphs. And Encarsia also attacks the pupae through host feeding. So a lot of people are under the misconception that, you know, Aramoceros is for Vermesia and Encarsia is for uh, greenhouse white fly and that's it. But it's, there's lots of literature out there showing that Encarsia actually does parasitize Vermesia white fly. And in Canada, we actually think that most of the control happens through that host feeding. They really do seem to feed more than maybe Aramoceros does. So really what you're trying to do is take these four biocontrol agents and sort of just pick a couple of them in order to attack multiple life stages, because attacking more than one life stage is really what makes a biocontrol program successful. If you just focus on one, like eggs or nymphs, too many are going to get missed and they're going to get out of control. So you want to do something like pick predatory beetles to attack your eggs, but then also pick a parasitoid maybe that will attack the nymphs. And maybe if you pick one that does host feeding on the pupae, now you've got three life stages covered and you're basically golden. So out of this information, in Canada, there are basically three main programs. So option one is the stand, what I'm gonna call the standard parasitoid program. So it's high rates of Aramoceros and Encarsia. And this is the program sold sort of by all the big biocontrol companies like your Coperts, your BioVest, your BioLines. Usually they come on little um, mixed parasitic wasp cards where they emerge off the cards. The second option I'm gonna call the West Coast program. So this um, comes out of um, a Canadian supplier in BC called Applied Bionomics. And their program consists exclusively of Encarsia as well as um, the predatory beetle Delphastis. And the last is the kitchen sink approach, which is sort of like using all the bios we have at our disposal, but that can um, get more complicated. So I'm just gonna focus on the first two. And all of these strategies work each with their pros and cons. And I just wanna take a second and talk about this in car um, fresh Encarsia in the West Coast program. So the reason this program is able to get away with one wasp and at very low rates is because um, they purport that fresh Encarsia, so Encarsia that have never been chilled for storage or shipping, have better fitness characteristics. So we mean things like reproductive rate, parasitism rates, flight capacity, mating, all of that stuff. So does that actually hold any water? There was actually studies done in Canada to see if this was true about a decade ago. And um, I won't go, you don't need to go into too much details in these graphs, but basically, if you look at the chilled side versus the fresh side, this is for Encarsia and Aramoceros, the lines are higher on the fresh side. So basically what this comes down to is there's a 20 to 50% decrease in flight capacity when these parasitoids are chilled. And another good example, I'm not gonna show you all the fitness characteristics, but we're gonna look at parasitism rates for a second for Encarsia. Again, you can see there's a big gap between the lines of the fresh and the chilled. So when they're chilled, you basically see a 50% decrease in parasitism. So that is a valid argument. So that's why that program is able to work. All right, so um, we've talked about the programs uh, and fair, how fairly simple they are. And I would also argue that another reason biocontrol might even be more simple than pesticides is because um, Back to that resistance issue. So we know that Q is a lot more resistant than B. Growers start to get concerned about that if they do some sprays and they don't seem to be working. So what some growers do is send off samples to the USDA in Florida um, to have genetic testing done to see the ratio of B to Q in their crop. Um, and you need that genetic testing. You can't look at them under a microscope and tell the difference between B and Q. If anyone tells you they can do that, they're incorrect. Um, but you need like a quite a bit of samples from throughout your greenhouse to get an idea of the ratio. 
And in a perfect world, you would spray and then check that ratio again to see if you're, you're shifting stuff more towards Q. And the simple part of this is biocontrol agents just don't care if they're B or Q. They'll eat both species equally. So all of that kind of uh, you know, messing around with worrying about what pesticides are going to work and whether you've got B or too many Qs or if you're going to push it towards Q, you just don't need to worry about that. All right, so now I'm going to get into the meat and potatoes of the talk. I think this is really what people are interested in, is, is whether or not biocontrol in a head-to-head -head test to pesticides, um, or is it as effective? The first thing I want to do is flip that question around on its head a little bit and ask, are pesticides for whitefly that effective? So going back to the study from Texas A&M, um, where we talked about how the threshold really wasn't zero, 35 to 100% of the plants were infested. Um, they had up to 40 nymphs on average per plant, and the maximum number of nymphs they found on any one point study was 220. So this was done in Texas where pesticide rotation is the norm for producers. So obviously, even with all the available pesticides done in the US, a rotation program is not getting you perfect control. And in terms of resistance, it really is sort of like a sliding scale from what works on greenhouse white fly to Bemisia. So you can see we've got lots of products in Canada, these are the Canadian trade names that are effective on greenhouse white fly. That starts to shrink as we get to Bemisia white fly. Some of these projects have, products have been deregistered, which is why they're crossed out in red. And other ones have question marks next to them because efficacy is constantly changing with white fly, depending on the population genetics, depending on the active ingredients used at the propagator end and depending on the active ingredients you're using at your end. And you can see this list shrinks even more in Canada where we think we maybe only have one effective pesticide for Q. It worked last year, we don't know if it's gonna work this year. And I understand the US obviously has a lot more chemicals at their disposal, but I think this um, decreasing return on investments um, is, a, is a fair analogy for the states as well. So back to actually putting pesticides and biocontrol head to head, how did we prove this and show and convince growers um, that this could work? Well, we did repeated on-farm trials in Ontario. So we're talking big commercial producers where we can actually do things that are logistically feasible and economically feasible for the grower. So these aren't research compartments where we can just sort of like do crazy rates and like, you know, um, whatever we want that's sort of not realistic. So in this commercial operation, the treatment compartments for um, were comprised of 10,000 plants per compartment. Uh, each compartment was a mix of reds and colors. The crop was monitored weekly, and we also determined the cost per pot, which I'll talk about later. And this trial has been going on for over five years at this point, so we've got tons of data on it. Although I won't inundate you with all the data, I'm just gonna show you three critical years is, that are really good examples. But the other thing that's important to note is doing this on-farm trial, the grower was paying for everything. He basically said, here, have 40,000 plants, compare biocontrol to pesticides, and if you screw it up, I'll pay for it. Because he really wanted to know the answer and to be able to share that information with the rest of industry as well, which I think is one of our strengths up here in Canada is sharing that kind of information. So we're gonna talk about 2017 first. We had three compartments. The one compartment we did the West Coast program that I talked about with low rates of Delphastis and Incarsia, that fresh Incarsia. The second compartment was our standard parasitoid program, which is high rates of two parasitoids. And then we compared this to pesticide applications as needed. And the rates um, were the rates recommended by the suppliers. The biologicals were started at potting and pesticides were started in mid-September. And I'll talk about more why we picked that later. And just a note about program costs. All of these programs, the goal was to keep them around 10 cents per pot because that's what Canadian growers are willing to spend. That's sort of their threshold or anything much more than that is gonna start eating into their profits. So, you know, we can't do a, a research project where we're throwing all the biologicals in that I'm sure would clean up the plants very nicely because that would just be over threshold in terms of cost. Okay, so I'm gonna show you these results and this kind of graph over and over. 
So um, our y-axis over here is the percent of plants infested in mid-October. So this all is relating back to that threshold that I told you about before, where if we hit 20% of plants infested around mid-October, as long as we're under that 20% threshold, the program is successful and all the plants will likely be sellable later in the season. So here's how 2017 played out. And I should note that 2017 was a good white fly year, meaning the cuttings came in and they were pretty clean. Growers could see there wasn't much pressure. Um, so things went well, which was great. So you can see that all three programs, whether it's pesticides or the two biocontrol programs, were well under this 20% cutoff. So we were somewhere between the four to 10% of plants infested, which is incredible. That's a very clean crop. And if you're interested in rates, the West Coast program, remember we're talking really low rates. So we're talking about 0.25 wasps per meter squared. Sorry, that's a metric. Um, this, that was released per week, plus two Delphastis per meter squared released in two introductions earlier in the crop. For the standard parasitoid program, we're talking about much higher rates. So nine wasps per meter squared every week for 15 weeks. And then for our pesticides, we did a uh, contest and distance one application each at the high label rate. Okay, so the elephant in the room is always what happens in a bad white fly year. So what does a bad white fly year mean? Obviously, if you open up the bags of cuttings and you can see that they're chock full of white fly, uh, that's not a good year. And there was, um, in 2018, it was even uh, a little bit more apparent that it was a bad year because some of the suppliers were actually contacting their customers and saying, look, we've got a lot of white fly in our stock plants. Um, here's the list of chemicals we use so that you can try to do a rotation program around these. Um, and we know there's going to be a high starting number of white fly on the cuttings. And just adding to that, in our area, uh, we had an unusually hot August, which really ramps up the white fly. They, they can tolerate it pretty hot. So that didn't help the situation. So what treatments did we pick in 2018? Well, we did our West Coast program, our standard parasitoid program again, and pesticides. But we added a fourth compartment to this of 10,000 plants where we looked at fresh and carcia only, but at a higher rate. And the reason we did this is because it's really the, del the del fastest in the West Coast program that's adding to the cost. So we sort of wanted to jigger with it and say, okay, how could we drive the cost down of these biocontrol programs as much as possible? That would be with just the Encarcia, but to be safe, instead of using that 0.25 wasps per meter squared, we're gonna do something like two wasps per meter squared. So that was really sort of just, you know, a Hail Mary experiment, um, but you guys will see how it worked out. So this graph is still our percent infested plants on the y-axis, but I'm showing you how things worked out through time on the x-axis. So you can see at the beginning of the crop, things were pretty low. The biocontrol programs over time until mid-October um, all stayed under this successful cutoff of under 20% infestation. Whereas the pesticide program, you can see that it was already over this 20% cutoff in late August. And so we started pesticide applications in early September and did four to five pesticide applications and rotating active ingredients. And even with that, the plants ended up being um, over with, with over 60% of the plants infested with some level of white fly in mid-October. And ultimately what ended up happening is the grower had crop losses of almost 10%. So obviously that was not a successful program. And just to show you this bar graph again, same data, but in a bar graph, uh, just so we can look at how the different um, biocontrol programs stacked up. So technically the standard paras parasitoid program performed the best. Only 5% of the plants were infested with white fly, which is amazing considering this was such a bad white fly year. And even our Encarcia only rate, our sort of Hail Mary, can we make this cheaper treatment, was well under this cutoff as well. So all of these programs were highly successful and the pesticides just failed. So 2019 was what we're gonna call a medium white fly year. It wasn't so bad that the uh, propagators were reaching out and saying, eee, but growers were opening up bags and of cuttings and being like, oh, I don't feel so great about this. In this year, we decided to test the biocontrol programs that I've talked about um, over um, the same ones as the previous year. 
but get rid of testing the pesticides. And that was the growers' decision. After the previous year, where pesticides had just been such a nightmare for them, they just said, I don't want to do pesticides anymore, ever. Like, let's just test biocontrol and tweak it and see how it performs year after year. So here are the results in a medium white fly year. And I just want to draw attention to this line. So yes, this is our 20% cutoff, but these programs were all still successful because the grower didn't have to spray. So yes, this is a, a threshold, but it's more like a guideline. There's a little bit of wiggle room there, and that depends on a few things that you find during scouting, which I'll, I'll go into. And once again, the standard parasitoid program was around that 5% infested plants, and the other ones were sort of just over 20. All right, so getting into the, is biocontrol too expensive? I'm going to show you the same graphs I showed you before, but reveal how much they actually cost. All right, so looking at the 2017 treatments, which you'll remember is a good white fly year, um, here's how the costs played out. Remember, all of these programs were highly successful, but obviously the pesticides were the cheapest at two cents per pot. The standard parasitoid program was at 12 cents per pot, which is, you know, pushing that 10 cents per pot threshold that growers really want to spend per pot. Um, and the cheapest biocontrol program was the West Coast program, which is the low rate of Encarcia and Delfastis. So what about our bad white fly year? So let's talk about the pesticides first. This year, they were not the cheapest. So they cost over 10 cents per pot, but then we also have to add into that the crop losses of 10% of the crop or 9% of the crop. So this is why the grower was so unhappy with it because they spent a lot on it and they still had crop losses. So in this year, the economic winner was actually this Encarcia only treatment. So remember, it was still under the threshold and it only cost three cents per pot. So that's very cost competitive with pesticides when they do work, that two cents per pot that we just saw last year. And finally, our 2019 treatments. Remember, we decided to remove pesticides, so that's not an option. Again, the Encarcia only rate was the winner at three cents per pot. The West Coast program ended up being around nine cents per pot that year, just because we needed some rescue Delfastis because we were getting close to this threshold. And the standard parasitoid program at 12 cents a pot was the most expensive, but again, offered the most sort of reliable control. So what it comes down to when you're talking about costs of biocontrol programs is yes, they can be more expensive than pesticides. We're not gonna sugarcoat that. But some of them can be quite cost competitive, but ultimately they are more reliable. So for a lot of growers, that's worth it to not have to stress about these bad white fly years and not knowing what chemicals are going to work, you know, asking around to the, the propagators and other producers, like what's working for you? What should I do? All of that sort of um, uncertainty gets taken out with biocontrol. You know you're going to do your biocontrol program every year. You're not really going to change it and your results should always be under that 20% threshold that will get you to sale. Now, you may be wondering which of these programs you should pick. Obviously, I'm not here to, to purport any one company. Um, that's not my job. So it really um, comes down to your farm and what you're able to do. So the high cost programs, yes, they're 100 to 200% more expensive than the other biocontrol programs but they had the lowest infested plants each year in our study. They were really consistent. And then the other thing we have in Canada, maybe just because we're such a, uh, like it's such a tight region of growing, uh, most of these companies offer a lot of technical support, which can come as reps that come out to um, your farm and actually do the scouting and do the reports for you or other technical support. So that's value added into that 12 cents per pop we're talking about. The low cost programs are much more cost competitive with pesticides. So if you just don't want to spend over a certain amount, they're a good choice. Um, but a couple of years, they could be close to that threshold line. So they may require a more watchful eye. So I would say that this really depends on your manpower to scout regularly, although that presence absence scouting does make things a lot easier. OK, so hopefully we've addressed all these concerns. So how do we put this all together into a comprehensive IPM program from start to finish? You know, I love biocontrol, but we're not necessarily going to rely on it entirely. 
a robust IPM program using all the tools in the toolbox is obviously always your safer bet. So in a nutshell, this infographic shows the Ontario Bemisia IPM program. So the first thing in the program um, is planning. So where are you going to get your cuttings from? What varieties are you picking? Can you make any of those choices dependent on lower white fly starting numbers? And any program tweaks you want to make from what happened in the year before, like our grower who was just like, I'm done with pesticides. The next thing that you want to do is dip your cuttings and reduce risk in to reduced risk insecticides to minimize the starting population of white fly in your greenhouse. Um, and my colleague that I work with at Vineland Station, Dr. Rose Boutenhaus, um, developed this. And you can see her recording on the AFE uh, YouTube channel. Um, she just did it um, the previous talk to Mike. So I won't go any more into that. So the next thing is initiating biocontrol. So a few notes on timing. Most growers start their biocontrol programs at potting, but some do it on the misting bench as well. So you can do broadcasts of your mites or your parasitoids on the misting bench, or you can even do those emergence cards that have both the parasitoids on it, as long as you make sure to cover that card with a styrofoam cup so it's not constantly getting wet, because otherwise what can happen is the PP can mold and then the wasps don't emerge properly. Um, so you want to do your broadcasts weekly, and, and some growers are concerned like, oh, it's too wet for the bios to be able to work. But you have to think about you know, the thrips and the white fly and everything else that does just fine in misting. If they do fine, it stands to reason that your biocontrol agents will do fine as well. The one little caveat to this is Delfastis. It's a bit of a canary in the coal mine in terms of its sensitivity to pesticide residues. So you wanna wait at least four weeks after sticking cuttings to avoid pesticide residues. So that's, that's sort of a hard and fast rule on that. Um, I'm sure some of you are wondering about scouting, which is great because that's the keystone of IPM is scouting and helping you make decisions. So how do we scout? Growers often ask me about cards, are they useful or not? But actually I was part of a research project in the early 2000s where we looked at the cards and the plants and tried to see if there was a relationship between them and there just wasn't. Um, so, you know, the cards can tell you you have white fly, but you know you're going to have white fly because they come in on cuttings um, and they won't tell you anything about how you make decisions. So put those cards away. And uh, really what you should be doing is doing plant inspections. So again, this presence absence sampling on whole plants every seven to 10 days, starting in mid August to late October. And what you wanna do is pick up that plant um, a little bit above your head or on an angle and rotate it so that you're able to see the underside of the foliage uh, on both the top, like new growth and the old growth of the plant. And that's what's it lets you tell, okay, does this plant have white fly on it, even just one adult or not? Um, and in terms of how much to scout, we recommend scouting 5% of the crop every time. So if in a compartment of 10,000 plants, that would only be looking at 10 to 20 plants per bench. Um, and then you just record in a notebook, like on that bench, bench one, you mark down which ones are have white fly and which don't. So if you're looking at 10, maybe you see five that have white fly on them. And that's what helps you determine that 20% of all the plants you looked at do 20% have white fly. And just a note that you wanna record your reds and your colors separately because we know the colors tend to be more attractive to white fly. So you're probably gonna make different IPM decisions for your reds versus your colors. But just remember, again, this threshold of 20% is just a guide. Um, there's some wiggle room but there's some questions you need to ask yourself. So say you get to mid-September and you're getting close to that 20% line and you're getting nervous. There's questions you need to ask yourself. So is your main red variety heavily affected in all areas or just one? If that's occurring, that's a red flag. Are, but if it's just in the colors, that's more easy to deal with because you could do spot applications there. Are you seeing little evidence of biocontrol working again in all areas or just one? Obviously, if you're not seeing evidence of your biocontrol working, you're gonna need to step in with a different method. Are you seeing white fly colonization on new growth or is it on old growth only? We sort of expect it to be on the old growth because that's where the cuttings started. Um, so it may just be the biocontrol programs, you know, finishing off those old infestations. But if you start to see colonization on new growth, that means you've got a lot of adults 
running around and is a, a red flag as well. And lastly, do most plants have at least one densely colonized leaf? What we're really hoping to see when we count a plant as infested is what we sometimes call onesie twosies. You know, you just see one or two adults or pupae on there and you're like, great, it's infested, but it's not that bad. Even a leaf that looks like this, where you can see maybe like eight or nine nymphs on here, I'm not that excited about. That doesn't count as a dense populated leaf. I think you all know the type of leaf that I'm talking about where you turn it over and you're like, that's a lot of white fly. So that would be a red flag as well. So if you're answering yes to basically more than two of these questions, you might want to step in with pesticides, which is why we have that threshold. Um, and these are the questions that help you determine, okay, if I've crossed that threshold, what does it mean and what do I do? And just a note about um, figuring out if your biocontrol is working or not by looking for evidence that it's working. So you want to look for parasitized pupae or nymphs. The ones parasitized by Encarcia will look black and yellow. I know with greenhouse whitefly, they normally just look all jet black, but we get this weird sort of like head body thing going on. Um, and Aramoceros just sort of looks yellow and tannish. And then the other thing you want to look for is host feeding. So remember I mentioned Encarcia really seems to work uh, mostly through host feeding. So these clear ones are where um, white fly have successfully hatched out of their pupil cases. So they're clear and flat, but the host fed ones still have, you know, white fly material in there. So they sort of look like brown and smushed. So uh, this takes a bit of practice to see with a hand lens, but it is a good indicator. Okay, so the last thing I'm gonna talk about in the IPM program is where pesticides fit in. And what we're really talking about here is delayed pesticide applications. We want to not apply pesticides until mid to late September at the earliest. So the biocontrol is really taking care of everything up until then. And then if you need pesticides, this is when it would happen. And the reason for this um is how b and q behave under spray and no spray conditions so under spray conditions i think we all know bamesia q type is favored bamesia b type most will die you might get a couple resistant ones floating around so every year when you get your cuttings you're always getting a ratio of b to q um it's usually never 100 percent q it's under 50 percent usually but spraying early in the crop promotes q biotype but if you delay the sprays by two to three white fly generations, which is around eight to 10 weeks, the bees will take over. And why is that? It all comes down to how good they are at mating. So under no spray conditions, Bamesia bee type has no problem finding mates. Interestingly, I feel a little bad for them. The Q females have a hard time figuring out which is a bee male and which is a Q male. So if they're mating with bee males, they're truly two different species, which means they're not reproductively compatible. So they're having a whole bunch of sterile offspring. Um, so that's really why this is happening. All right, so we've done our dippings. We've initiated biocontrol. We've started scouting in late August. And if necessary, we put on delayed pesticide applications. The last thing to do is a post-mortem. So this grower that we worked with every year, we sat down at the end of the crop and we said, what worked, what didn't, what was too expensive, what can we dial back on? And uh, that's been really successful for us. And then we usually share that information with other growers. So just to summarize the role of biocontrol within IPM of Vimesia and Poinsettia, since I've really been saying it's the backbone, I think it's important to sort of end on this note that biocontrol we've shown you is as effective as pesticides and it can be cost competitive. And all biocontrol programs are similarly effective and reliable compared to pesticides. So picking a program really depends on um, the cost, the value added in that cost, and your scouting capabilities on your farm. So even when using biocontrol just to delay pesticide sprays in an IPM program, that's a better approach than using pesticides only. Um, so basically it's like 
using biocontrol early in the crop is like buying insurance for your pesticides. You know they're going to work later because the population is going to be more B and less Q, and you're gonna have a way higher chance of success. So the last thing I'll leave you with is shameless blog promotion. I talk a lot about uh, poinsettia and bemisia this time of year, and my counterpart, um, Dr. Siobhan Dayball at Amafra, talks a lot about the production side of things. Um, so if you subscribe to the blog, you'll get information coming straight to your email. We promise not to inundate you. We do about four, maybe four posts a month. And lastly, I just want to thank um, my collaborators and cooperators, the grower who's done this, oh, one more, the grower who's done this project for five plus years on his farm, which is amazing. And Graham Murphy, my predecessor, who's now a consultant with um, Biological Consulting. And with that, that's the end of my talk. Well, Sarah, I'd like to thank, thank you so much for your presentation with us today. And um, with that, I, I will go ahead and open up the floor to the Q&A. So if you have any que questions, feel free to put that into the Q&A or the chat so we can work through that. Um, but to just kind of get us started right off the bat, um, so do we know which pesticides or chemical classes that Q whitefly has shown resistance to in the U.S.? Um, yeah, that's a pretty complicated question. I think just because it varies year to year based on, as I said before, what the, the propagators are doing at that end. So what you're receiving in terms of uh, what your whitefly on your cuttings have been exposed to already. Um, uh, but generally, Q biotype or Q species of whitefly technically can become resistant to every legal and illegal pesticide people have access to. Some of the more successful ones in general um, that I've read from my uh, extension counterparts in the state tend to be things like uh, Rycar, uh, Pyrofluquinazone, Judo, which is Spiromesophen, and Safari Dinotetrafuran. We only have um, Judo in Canada, so that's why it doesn't make a great rotation program for us. Uh, but those three chemicals seem to work consistently well, at least one of them. Um, but really the secret with Q species is to do a rotation program, make sure you're not spraying any one class of chemicals more than twice, um, and just sort of keep an eye on things. And if things aren't working, move on to a different chemical class. So kind of a follow up, and this is just more from my not knowing so much about this background as maybe other folks might. Um, so do the delayed pesticide applications affect your beneficials as well, or is it just mainly focusing on your Wi-Fi populations? Yeah, delaying the pesticide applications, often once you start with pesticides, unless you're starting with a pesticide that has high compat compatibility with natural enemies, um, maybe something like um, belief flinicamid, so I think that's aria in the states, that's fairly compatible. But once you start moving up the chain into things like contos and judo, those are pretty incompatible with most of the parasitoids. And certainly delphastis, because as I mentioned before, it's sort of a canary in the coal mine when it comes to pesticides. So we generally consider that once you've started those pesticides, your biocontrol program is probably dead. But if you did want to try to conserve it, you should try to pick the soft, softest chemicals first and work up from there. But that's why it is such a hard, like a kind of line in the sand. And that's why you want to delay it as much as possible. That is for the B and Q population genetics business. But it's also because once you start on the pesticide treadmill, it's really hard to get off of it. Gotcha. All right, that makes sense. Thank, thank you. For me, that helps. <laughs> um, Say you had mentioned that some com companies will sell these parasitic cards, and where should they be placed in a crop to have the best efficacy to work the most eff eff effectively? Yeah, that's also a really important question. Um, so we know from hanging mite sachets in lots of different crops that humidity really matters. So those sachets are kind of like a little ecosystem if they get to um, dry, they need a lot of humidity, or if sun's directly baking them, um, not as many will emerge. So the same thing is true as your white fly cards. You kind of just want to 
tuck them in the plant foliage. Usually they have a little hook on them or they're on a stick or something. And you can sort of tuck them in the foliage just so they're protected from the sun. And also they're, they have a little higher humidity within that plant canopy. Gotcha. Um, all right. Then, so biologicals, they, when they're shipped to you, most of the time they are, they're alive. So did you, have you experienced any issues Delivery of your biological con con controls because I definitely have been shipped a few shipments myself where they all got baked and you're just like, well, yep. I mean, it, it happens to everyone. Like it happens to all the suppliers. It's not always the supplier's fault. It can happen any way through that you know chain of handling. So it is important to inspect your bios when they come and make sure they are alive and emerging um, with those parasitic. Uh, cards, it's fairly easy to see that they are healthy and emerging because um, after you hang them up, if you go back and revisit where they are, you can see little emergence holes out of the pupil cases. So you're like, okay, they definitely successfully emerged. Um, also, my uh, counterpart at the Vineland Research and Innovation Center here in Ontario, she actually developed a quality assurance guide for growers. And that does include parasitoids. So it's a way of sort of like maybe holding back a few of those parasitic cards or maybe a few pupae if you're a broadcast releasing or there's instructions there for mites as well um, about how to know how many are actually emerging um, and how, how successful your program is going to be on that. So I'll just drop that in the link. I've got it up right this second. So it's a good read. For anyone who's doing biocontrol, it doesn't just have to be of poinsettia or with whitefly. It sort of covers all the different biocontrol agents. And um, the growers here have found it very useful, and it was done in collaboration with most of the major biocontrol companies. Thank you for that. Yeah, having those re -resource resources right there are really, really important, important, yeah. important. <laughs> yeah, and there's a link to my blog there as well for people who are asking about that. So, yeah. I say, well, I've I know I've only got about one more question left in in this queue. So if anyone else has any more questions, this is like a speak now or forever hold global <laughs> peace type type of thing. Granted, you can always reach out to Doc Doctor Drancher Jan Driss Drissick, but this is your chance. Um, so when you were going through your presentation a little while while ago about the crop losses that you saw in that really heavy year based you using only the spray pro program did that align with what the grower was seeing in the rest of their grower range range ranges and kind of align with what other growers in the region were going through that that year or was it just in that one section of you know those 10,000 plants that you were look, looking at that that year yeah, that's a good question. So he didn't have any other poinsettia production outside of the four treatment compartments he gave us. So that's his whole production. Um, so you saw that the other compartments that were biocontrol only did much better. So really the losses just happened in the pesticide one. And um, I, I would have to say that most growers in Ontario do the true kind of IPM program where they're putting their bios on early in the crop mostly to delay the need for pesticides. And if they need, do need pesticides, it's much later. So you'll notice we started pretty early because we were doing just pesticides. So we started like mid early September, which is sort of like getting in that uncomfortable zone of we maybe haven't let it run long enough to have the bees overtake the cues. So that truly was in that sense, an experimental compartment. I don't think any other growers really were relying that heavily on pesticides. Although now that I'm talking about it, I do seem to remember like a handful, maybe like one or two growers who had started off with pesticides pretty early in the year that were really struggling. And um, if if they didn't have crop losses, they were really nail biting right into the end. So. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, and then one last kind of follow up or another follow up question, question kind of to that is that um, where is the Florida site that you can submit all of your white your white flies to to get that genetic testing done to get that cute. Yeah, you may want to reach out to them just to make sure they still do that. I haven't sent samples in a couple of years, but I believe it's through Cindy McKenzie at the USDA station. Which station is I can't remember. Um, she also works with Lance Osborne that many people may know. He's an extension agent and research scientist in Florida. 
Um, so reaching out to either one of them uh, through their websites or their information pages is probably the best way to go through that. Gotcha. Yes, another one. All right. So how early do the insects have to be pur pur purchased to be able to use them for the poinsettia crop? And what happens if, again, the war should occur? Shipping delays is kind of the name of the game right right now. If they die and you and you miss a week of insects. Yeah, so um, often you usually plan with your biocontrol supplier beforehand and say, I'm going to do a poinsettia program. I'm going to need them this week because this is the week I'm potting up my crop. And remember, your potting up is probably going to change depending on the size of your pots, right? You're going to pot up your eight weeks earlier and then your six weeks after that and then your four weeks after that. So you sort of just have to schedule it. And I would say most biocontrol suppliers um, that I've worked with have about a, a two week lag time. So like if you want them on Tuesday, the 14th, you should order them like the 30th, you know, two weeks before, and then they'll arrive when you need them to arrive. Um, and they usually have a strict date, like you order them on a Tuesday and they show up on a Tuesday kind of situation. So that depends on the biocontrol supplier, but that's sort of a broad sort of average of 10 to 14 days from ordering to getting into your hands. Um, with doing a biocontrol program where you're releasing week after week, so that's a true inundative release, right? Like you're inundating the crop with bios every week. You're not expecting any of these biocontrol agents to actually establish except for maybe the Delphastis at the beginning of the crop. Everything else is a weekly release. If you miss a week, it's not, it's not gonna blow your program away. Um, also what some of the growers here do is definitely during the heavier part of their crop, they'll often um, double up on those parasitic cards. So potentially what you can do is if you've missed a week um, because of something that happened at the supplier end or the shipping end, you could maybe contact your biocontrol company and say, look, can I have double then the next week and put the, a higher rate out than is even normal out to try and sort of uh, get past that little setback that might have happened. But um, unless it's happening, unless it's like a rescue organism, you know, like if you're putting out Delphastis because you've got hot spots because you're nearing that 20 percent threshold cutoff, you should be OK if you miss a shipment. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, oh, all right, we got one, one more here. From August to October, there's a big chance to have botrytis in the greenhouse. Any fun and fungicide can be harm, harmful to the Bemisbia bio program? Yeah, that's a good question. We don't have a ton of information about um, fungicides and how they impact natural enemies. There's a couple like classic ones, like we know that Senator uh, uh, thio, uh, thiophanate methyl I think it cleary something in the states i'm not very good with my us trade names but thiophanate methyl um which can help with botrytis uh is one that can impact certain biocontrol agents um also if you're just spraying something like like mill stop um that can burn you know any biocontrol agents that happen to be on that plant a little bit but other than that i would say you're fairly safe and i would also say that Botrytis has just as much chance of wiping out your crop or causing cross losses than uh, the bios do. So, um, you know, it's important to get that, those fungicides on, um, drench them if possible, uh, so you're not spraying the crop and, um, you know, do things that you can help culturally too, like increasing ventilation or increasing plant spacing. We often see it up here in our four inch poinsettias because growers like to cram them a little bit better, like in a little bit more to sell, um, just make them more cost effective. Like, so you get more on the bench and a lot of growers have figured out that's, that's not the thing to do. So um, that can be part of your planning program, you know, like if you think botrytis is a problem for you in your greenhouse, maybe you want to think about ventilation and spacing now so that um, you don't have to get into those situations where you do have to do a lot of spraying and then worry how that's impacting your biocontrol program. Because the short and dirty answer is just like, we don't know a lot because they've never really been tested, so. Gotcha. 
thank you so very much for your time and your expertise and being willing to just come on and give us the, this talk on like the last half hour or 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 so so yeah i'd like to thank all of you for join joining us today for another session of afe's grow pro webinar series join us next month for dr tom fernandez's presentation on reducing pesticides in surface and subsurface irrigation water on Tuesday, July 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can reg register in endowment.org slash GrowPro. While you are there, please um, check out our past webinar recordings, uh, other grower-related resources sources and read reports available to you for free thanks to industry support um, we ask that you please um, complete the brief sur sur survey about today's session where you can suggest additional top topics and help us continue to improve these web webinars so thank thank you again for joining us Doc dr dr Jan jandrisic thank you so much and hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day great thank you so much mary for hosting